Well, welcome to Current Yield, the Grants Interest Rate Observer podcast. And uh, with us today is, is Lakshman Akuthan, who is the Chief Operating Officer of uh, something called ECRI. And we're going to hear a lot from Lakshman in a moment, but uh, I want to introduce the rest of the cast of characters. To my immediate left is Eric Whitehead, our very well-traveled engineer. Hello, Eric. Don't say anything. And across from me in diagonal direction is to the great Evan Lorenz, Deputy Editor of Grants. And I, I am Jim Grant, and I am I'm a little bit post-party because we had our, um, not postpartum, post-party, we had um, a conference on Tuesday, right, Evan? It was, yeah. the, uh, it was the, uh, the 35th birthday celebration of Grant's Interest Rate Observer folded into the uh, the annual fall conference we put on. And uh, I'm going to say, Evan, this is in a dispassionate and objective way. I'm going to say it was fabulous. It was what, great. Do, what do you think? Yeah. I think the champagne at the end was only half as good as a conference. And it was good champagne. I told Eric to get the second most expensive. Well, okay, fine. If it was that good, it was that good. We'll pay for it later. Like paying for other things, right? Like QE and the such. Yeah. Enjoy now, pay later. But as I say, today we are, uh, first of all, I, you know, this is a commercial enterprise, so we're sponsored by uh, us, Grants Interest Rate Observer. And presently, you will be hearing from John Delberto, who is the uh, long-serving, I don't know, the overseer of, uh, of our subscribers. He signs them up, and uh, when they choose to depart, which is uh, infrequently, mercifully, uh, he sees them off with uh, a little sad sales pitch. He's sad at the end because it's not, it's not working, but uh, John is going to tell you a few things about grants you might not know, so he's coming later. But uh, to get down to business and the business cycle, Lakshman, uh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, just to lay things out, uh, to get down to first principles first, the world is a cyclical place, no? If you're dealing with market-oriented economies. Right, so we're not yes. talking We're not talking about permanency. We're talking about things that go up and down and sideways, right? There's an ebb and a flow in All right. the affairs of men. All right, and <laughs> of, uh, let's not forget the others... Uh, women. The women. Uh, okay. So um, ECRI, ECRI, the uh, Economic Cycle Research Institute, I have the fondest recollection of its origins because I was a great big uh, uh, Jeffrey Moore fan. Jeffrey was uh, one of the pioneers of uh, the study of business cycles. Uh, what, what, what were his dates approximately? Was he born early in the 20th century, was he? Yes, early in the 20th century, went through uh, 2000. Oh, okay. And he was in on the ground floor of the National uh, uh, Business Cycle Ab- Research? Absolutely. He studied at the knee of uh, Wesley Mitchell uh, and helped create the original leading economic indicators. The, yeah. the Wall Street Journal called him the father of leading indicators. Right. And he w- went on to found ECRI with you and Anurvan, mm-hmm. right, at Anurvan Banerjee. That's correct. At Columbia. Columbia was the in- hosting institution. Hosting institution, and, and we went, uh, we left Columbia in the mid 90s. With, with a degree, I suppose. Right? Uh huh. With a, a degree in cycles, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and we've been, uh, we set up camp not too far from the original. Uh, NBER, which was on 39th and Park before it moved yeah. uh, north. Okay, this is all uh, this is very interesting and, and useful background to the business at hand, which is uh, doping out what happens next in the mm-hmm. world of uh, money and banking and uh, commerce, right? So mm-hmm. you keep uh, a whole I don't know a whole uh, suite of um, of indicators, and among these indicators is a, a set of leading indicators about inflation, no? Yes, the and, fu- future and, inflation gauge. Right, future inflation gauge. And uh, before you tell us what it is saying, please tell us what it is. So it's a leading indicator of inflation cycles, and its primary purpose, its reason for being, is to anticipate the risk of a peak or a trough in the rate of inflation. And that is different and distinct from peaks and troughs in economic growth. Uh, and this was a big insight that still is not fully appreciated. Uh, many of the models out there, uh, so-called uh, frameworks that explain the economy, tried to hardwire inflation and growth together. Moore did no such thing. In the wake of the uh, stagflation of the 70s, came to terms with the observation that cycles in inflation can have different timing of peaks and troughs, right, okay. and they could be long and variable uh, differences. So let's... let's um get down to the immediate forecast, and we'll get to the whys and the wherefore. Mm-hmm. So what is the future inflation gauge saying? It's saying that uh, inflation is cycling down. To what level approximately? Is it, is it going to go to, is it going to go less than zero? Is it going to, we're going to look at a deflation? Is it going to be a, a moderately lukewarmish 2%-ish inflation? What is it, you know, well, what, what consequences think, is the call? Well, I think the consequence is primarily one of direction if you're looking for it to go up, and it goes down. So there's a consequence like we've seen, actually, uh, for the last couple of prints, 
of inflation disappointing to the downside, despite all of the headlines that and, and reasoning for it going the other way. But it disappoints the downside in terms of tenths of a percentage point. Mm-hmm. And I wonder about the accuracy of the sampling. I wonder about the seasonal adjustment, about these things that uh, comprise the constitute mm-hmm. this number. Uh, there was a book written um, by the father of um, game theory, Oscar Morgenstern, called On the Accuracy of Economic Observations, the first edition in the early 50s, subsequent editions. And he laced into those gullible enough to take on face value anything mm-hmm. to the right of the decimal point. And he was slightly skeptical of things to the left of the decimal point in the CPI. What do you mm-hmm. say to that? I agree, is what I say. One of Dr. Moore's other uh, jobs for a little bit was uh, being commissioner of the BLS. And so, you know, I certainly heard a lot about the limitations, mm-hmm. the innards of these measurements. And absolutely, there's okay. a measurement issue. And for us, I think the key thing, going back to what right. the future inflation gauge does, is it gets the direction right. So if you're looking one way and the bus goes the other way, well, it matters a great, in, that matters, matters a great deal. It matters a great deal, certainly in the financial markets. I think the consumers are less likely to feel it. But let me get a sense of the degree to which Mm -hmm. the inflation rate, as observed, as measured, is Mm -hmm. going to decline. So are you talking about a move of, for example, say, a percentage point, which would take it from an expected 2.8? to an unexpected 1.8, or you're looking for something uh, that goes all the way down to like zero? How severe? Right. Or can you, is, it, is this the business of the gauge to tell how severe will be the direction? It is not the business of the gauge. So uh, this is, so, it's a directional gauge, okay. but I will pick on one word, unexpected. I think it will be unexpectedly weak. Okay. And in a cyclical turn, uh, let me define what that is. It's pronounced, pervasive, and persistent relative to past downturns in the rate of inflation. Can we not quantify this in terms of printed CPI metrics. So we're now looking at kind of a 2.4-ish, 2.5-ish on the headline number. Are we looking at... I see, I see, I see. Here's here's the here's the, the distance between the question and the answer, is that we do not run econometric models. We do not produce Mm -hmm. a point forecast. So we can talk about a directional change. And I think we could talk about the difference between disinflation and deflation. And deflation is not on the table, uh, but disinflation certainly is. And that's part and parcel of a cyclical downturn in inflation. Is it possible, does your model tell you what sectors are actually driving this decline in inflation? Because we've seen wages high, we've seen uh, shipping cost rise, oil has been up this year. Like, is it possible to say what's actually going to drive this downturn in the rate of inflation? Well, you know, again, uh, th- there's a need for a story, right? I, I totally get that. We don't come prepared with a story. We let the indicators tell us a story. So we have a whole host of leading indicators uh, trying to do this. Um, One, which is crystal clear, is a downturn uh, in the real home price growth. So we have a very, very clear downturn there. And it's possible that the level of home prices will actually uh, Mm. begin to decline. Uh, So that's part of the story. Um, But when we go to the future inflation gauge itself, it has um, kind of things that make sense in it. Money, credit, where are the bottlenecks? what's going on uh, with the interaction uh, with the rest of the world with currencies. All of those are drivers of inflation, sensitive industrial materials prices. Um, These are all drivers of inflation, or whichever one called the last one probably won't call the next turn. So what's very important when I go back to what a cyclical turn is, is how pervasive is it? Are the majority of the the drivers singing together? The advanced decline line, as it were. Yeah, yeah. before there were composite indexes, we all looked at diffusion indexes. And that's an aspect of what we're thinking about here. You know, uh, so uh, if if I hear you correctly, um, Lakshman, the things to know are, A, that the direction will surprise to the downside in, in the uh, subsequent and in future inflation prints, and that the uh, the perhaps the destination of the CPI will be at a rate that is below 2 or 1-ish, something or other, but in any case, not below 0 Possibly, probably. Is that fair to say? Well, with a snapshot given today, all of that sounds quite reasonable. We will have more information in a month or two or three or four. And 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 the leading, if the future inflation gauge plummets, maybe I'll revise that to being a a bit stronger to the. Well, we're going to know more in three years, certainly. (laughs) Hey, um, uh, here's here's a question from yesteryear. So uh, one of my favorite junctures in uh, in uh, late twentieth century economic affairs was that of the. Mid 60s, or 1964, the 
uh, the Keynesian magicians seems, seem to have won. Uh, negligible inflation, uh, very, very strong employment growth, very, very strong GDP growth, and, you know, behold. And then wouldn't you know it, uh, a state of imperfection settled in, and it lasted for 15 years or more, right? That was the great, it's the dawn of the great. So the, so the rate of inflation itself was not a leading indicator of secular inflation. The great inflation began in the mid 60s, called 1967 or so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bond yields following dutifully, and then some. Uh, but the, the future inflation gate says nothing about the possibility of a secular shift our inflation affairs, right? This You're talking about a direction that might, per, per, might be per, pervasive and persistent for mm -hmm. months, mm -hmm. but you're talking about um, a cyclical rather than a secular thing. Right. So I would say several months, a couple of quarters would be persistent. Um, and it, we can't really see farther than three, maybe four quarters with some of our longest leading indicators of growth, which is I a separate cycle. I can't see it all next Tuesday. So I'm <laughs> glad you have a Good. much better distance vision. Let's talk now about... Yeah. Uh, you know about GDP growth and about uh, the state of the economy, and you have in your bag of cycles, mm. you have something about uh, growth, no? Absolutely, and that's where we started with leading indicators of growth, and um, our indication has been for some time now, for a couple of quarters, that the economy was poised to decelerate, not accelerate. And so that's a somewhat uncomfortable, that's a very contrarian thing to say. And that's actually par for the course. Leading indicators are around turning points are going to diverge. All right. So if, if, Lachman, if I hear you correctly, you're mm -hmm. agreeing with Donald Trump. You're saying the Fed's crazy. <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't hear, I didn't hear, I didn't hear him say that which the is, economy is slowing. No, the it's, an it's, it's, a, it's an election year. Yeah, yeah, he did not yeah, say yeah. that. No, no, no. And, and, and I have news for you. Newsflash, the economy is slowing. Okay. Despite what GDP uh, is selling. You. And maybe this has something to do with measurement, by the way. We were talking about CPI earlier, and it, it, GDP is just as uh, fallible. There's the other side uh, of the uh, account, gross domestic income, uh, which is just as good uh, and measures the same economy. And that is slowing. It, the, the growth rate there fell below 2%. And that's in contrast to GDP being at 4%. Uh, the Philly Fed adds this all up and creates something called GDP plus, uh, GDI. They reconcile GDI with GDP. And they have have the rate of growth for the overall economy slowing from a high of 3.2% down to some 2% or so in the second quarter. That's very, very different. And it's consistent with our coincident data, the broader data on the economy, which shows that it's actually decelerating. Well, you are not in the buy low, sell high business, although some of your clients certainly mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to pin you down asking you to step out of your metier into the shoes of an investor, but it seems to me that the implication of what you're telling us is that uh, uh, bond yields may not go higher, may indeed go considerably lower, and that uh, if people are worried about interest rates uh, with respect to uh, their uh, the threat they pose to the stock market, that perhaps that threat is overblown. Well, um, we do not make market forecasts, but, the, uh, just, but to just, the extent... Just for this audience, extent, nobody, to, nobody's going to say anything, Lachman. Just, to the extent that growth and inflation uh, influence interest rates, okay, I will say that Again, we see growth decelerating and we see inflation disappointing to the downside. So um, there may be other things that will impact uh, interest rates, but if those, if it was limited to those uh, events, then there's um, a bit of an anchor. Uh, it's, it's hard to really run away. Lakshman, before we began the podcast, you told me a stat that I thought was pretty amazing, that if you look at the major economies around the world, the expansion in debt over just the last year is 10 times greater than the expansion in GDP. Could you right. repeat that sure, statistic sure. and also talk about to what degree do supply and demand factor into interest rates and kind of everything else in the economy? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's reasonable to say that borrowing has been propping up growth. Um, the combined debt specifically of the U.S., Eurozone, Japan, and China has increased more than 10 times as much as their combined GDP oh, over the past year. Yeah. Over the past year. How about over the past three, five, 10 years? Is this something oh, new yeah. or is this... Is no, no. But, it, but, but I think the point we were trying to make with this observation is that it's still happening. It's not over. And what's pretty amazing in a way, if you think about that, uh, plus you know, tax cuts plus an oil 
boom. Um, and we still have a deceleration in growth, a cyclical deceleration in growth that these uh, leading indicators picked up, which I think is becoming more apparent. Plus tax cuts. Plus tax cuts. So these are all idiosyncratic one-offs that are lifting, but there's a cyclical impetus in a free market-oriented economy that's cycling down. It does that. This is n natural. I think what's quite interesting, because maybe people are thinking about the Fed or the markets or President Trump is talking about the Fed, is the notion that cycling down in growth is something horrible or bad. This happens. It's it's actually the environment we live in if we live in a free market economy. Do we? <laughs> we we still do. We still do. Blackman, it's even, dominated e by even, market a, a even, activity. Even as you are not an investor, no, uh, nor are you, as far as I know, a governor of the Federal Reserve System. You're not a governor of the Fed, are you? Mm -hmm. No. Well, it speaks well of you, too. If you were, mm -hmm. if uh, if somebody said, Lakshman, you must for, a, I know, no, no sighing, if you must <laughs> <laughs> you must, for a day, replace Figure out what's going Chairman on. Powell okay. and uh, decide what to do about uh, interest rate rises that are projected. What do you think? Is, is the Fed going to we're going to proceed with uh, what is on the agenda and perhaps turn a an anodyne cyclical downturn into something more serious by unwarranted tightening of credit? It's happened before. So. It's, it's always happened. <laughs> it's always <laughs> happened. Also, we obviously have to think about uh, monetary policy in the context of cycles. And it is a bit frustrating when you see a cycle downturn to see all this talk of uh, hitting the brakes because it seems a little out of sync. And it's also equally frustrating to see a cycle upturn with them hitting the gas uh, full bore. It seems just on the face of it a little silly. I also, um, just one last since you opened the door on the Fed, I got I to gotta say, the other thing that seems a little odd is, understandably, we had a great recession and a financial crisis. And, you know, maybe it, it called for some pretty extraordinary measures. But that ended. And then you just have cycles. So the idea of a cycle downturn, let alone another recession at some point, it's not the end of the world. We've had almost 50 of them, and we're still here uh, in the history of the United States. Right, but, but, but it seems to me the ideology of, um, of national economic policy is to forestall any such thing, right? Which is a problem, because um, invariably, if something is cyclical, and you're almost guaranteed by whatever your methods are to be late, probably exacerbate the cycle. Okay, let me ask you that. Okay, so interest rates are prices, no? And mm -hmm. prices are better discovered than administered. Agreed. So with me, okay. And uh, I say, perhaps you agree or not, I say that the Fed and the Fed's counterparts the world over have uh, have twisted and distorted mm -hmm. and uh, have... Uh, uh, manipulated these prices uh, so they've become unrecognizable as prices and they are have been turned into instruments of national policy mm -hmm. which perhaps might explain a 10 times greater degree of growth in right. debt than in growth over right. the past year right so all right so that's a windy precedent to this question so um, Given that we have been privy to these immense distortions and unprecedented experiments in monetary policy, to what extent might ordinary cyclical measures be superseded by something we haven't seen before and something that might that might simply overpower yeah. the cyclical yeah. rhythms? Um, empirically, since the since all this QE exploded, uh, or since the financial crisis, which is you know a lot of intervention, extraordinary intervention, these cycle indicators on the question of direction have continued to work as advertised. They haven't changed, and this is actually why I'm even here. Okay, I could have been somewhere else. <laughs> you're, you're here, Lachman, We're here because we're pals. We're here because we're pals. But why am I talking about cycles? Why didn't I go off and do something else? I stumbled into Jeffrey Moore. You know, you just open. I had I was lucky enough to meet him. Saw. The that this leading indicator approach, getting the direction right, not worrying so much about the magnitude, was a very robust relationship that he was taking advantage of, not only in the United States, but also around the world. So not only across time, going all the way back to the Grant administration, okay, in, uh, in 1870. That was, uh, that was a good one. Uh, 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 to, to current times. Well, what about, the, you mentioned the rest of the world. Uh, yes. which is a very big topic, Lachman. Yes. But uh, do you have anything to impart to our listeners about affairs outside these 50 states? 
Well, you know, since uh, not that anyone listens to us, but uh, since the beginning, since the thousands beginning of people of at this instant are listening All right. to you. So here, so listen now. Since since uh, the end of last year, it was eminently clear, looking at the leading indicators that we've so described, there is a global industrial slowdown coming in 2018. And lo and behold, it's here. And emerging markets can't escape that. And you've seen what's been going on there. China, despite all the plans, can't escape that. And you see what's going on there. That actually comes back and reverberates to the U.S. because Chinese industrial uh, activity, cycling down quite clearly, brings down um, their uh, producer prices, which holds down our inflation. These are all linked. And it's very unlikely that the U.S. can de-link from all of that. And it hasn't. Evan Lorenz, do you have a, is that a tablet in your lap? Notebook. Can you uh, uh, cough up a, a, a stock ch a price chart of Toll Brothers? Mm. It, it's not been great. Well, let's see it. Well, show, it to the, show it to the listeners. I'm holding it up right now. All right, it's, it's going down, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, this would seem to speak, let's get back to housing for a second, yeah, yeah, being yeah. ever so important. So uh, the level of house prices might decline. Now, I'm not sure this is in your indicators, but uh, the interest rate sensitivity of the marginal home buyer be so acute that even a 50 basis point uptick or 100 in mortgage costs be the, the agent of the slowdown. It is definitely part of the recipe. The other part is uh, relatively weak uh, wage growth incomes. And for Toll Brothers, or I don't want to pick on Toll Brothers, but uh, a home builder, they're faced with lower inflation in their asking price or maybe even falling asking prices at the same time that their input prices are going up. Some of the tariffs are, are hitting them. And of course, when you look at the tightness in the labor market, uh, it's probably about the tightest in the construction sector. So their profitability is really just getting pinched. Well, um, <laughs> you have pinched us, oh. uh, Lakshman, with some very, very provocative ideas. And, uh, and I'm grateful to you for all the ideas you've given us over the years. I, I think the front page of Grants quotes you um, this particular issue, saying that, uh, that you'll be surprised, uh, you readers, uh, with the weakness in the CPI rather than mm. with the strength. There you go. Yeah. Thanks. So thank you for being here. And uh, Evan, as always, I thank you. Of course, you've got no choice working here i suppose and 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 same with eric who who uh you know who's interrupts his travels from time to time to be in the office so eric welcome thank, thank you welcome back well jim these cycles always turn so uh what goes down must go up and we're, we're watching so um we ought to talk to you again huh yeah let's do that okay thank you lakshman now ladies and gentlemen this is a, a special word from our sponsor because it's coming in the voice of the inimitable and uh and uh, for the former actor and i guess singer and nightclub thespian john delberto who for years and years has been uh, the voice of grants over the telephone uh, admonishing you or urging you to subscribe or to renew so john delberto can you tell the paid up subscribers what they might be missing yeah you, you didn't want me to sing this today no just uh, the, the straight didn't... voice is fine okay that, then i'll do that um yeah I, well i wanted to tell the paid up subscribers i just wanted to remind you to register on grantspub.com so you can get your issue shortly after the market closes every other wednesday to uh, be able to share articles with your friends family and colleagues to uh you know avail yourself of our almost 35 years of archives. That's about 4 million words of, uh, of more or less deathless prose, right? It's a lot of words. Yeah. And um, yeah, it'll take you a while. And also to access our investment ideas page, which uh, tracks our uh, many actionable ideas by ticker in reverse chronological order. You know, a lot of people just don't do this, right? A lot of people do not know about the web or seem not to be registered on it. Uh, exactly. Uh, we're trying to increase the registration yeah. and, uh, and many people underestimate the amount of actionable ideas because they have to sift through grants every other week and it helps them to be able to go to the the page and see all the tickers listed. And also, uh, registration will help you, uh, will enable you to access our uh, Droid and our iPad app as well. Okay. It's very simple. You just click the login button on the upper right hand corner of grantspub.com, click register, enter your email address and password, Boom. and you're done. Ah, thank you, John. Yes. And thank you, listeners, to The Current Yield. Talk to you next time.